All right, we'll get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name's Sean Dunn, and uh, I'm with uh, IHS. Um, so we actually have an office here in uh, uh, Bangalore. I'm from Calgary, uh, Alberta, Canada. So it's significantly warmer here uh, than it is back home at the moment, um, which, is, which is OK. Um, I don't mind. Um, and I'm an internal Agile coach uh, with IHS. Um, which is actually quite, you know, uh, quite interesting and unique because uh, it means I'm an employee of the company. I'm not a contractor. I'm not a consultant, but I have the, the wonderful opportunity to, to work and work with teams, internal teams across uh, across the globe, on a daily basis. So I kind of fell into that position. This wasn't something I looked to, you know, I, I thought I would ever be doing in my career. I kind of fell into it by accident, uh, but I absolutely love it and being able to interact with uh, everyone. And thank you to uh, my local colleagues here who've been so. Uh, uh, so hospitable. Uh, it's been a great experience. This is my first time to India. So what I'd like to talk about today is um, uh, building a, a self-sustaining agile organization. And, and what do I mean by that is, um, you know, with my experience over teams in the past few years, despite all the difficulties, it's, it's actually not too bad to get teams from, whether it's waterfall or just anarchy, to, okay, let's get them to do some basic agile practices, whether it's Scrum or Kanban or something like that. that. That's actually not too, too bad to do. But then when you start thinking about, okay, um, how do we make sure that we don't lose those gains? We, this newfound agility that we've, that we've discovered, how do we make sure that it isn't just the, the flavor of the month or the flavor of the year, that for you know, one year, five year, 10 years from now, beyond my current tenure, uh, how do we know that it's going to, uh, it's going to persist? And so this is kind of the, the question I, I started out trying to answer as I was working with teams and they were getting quite, you know, quite fluid and, and quite, um, uh, quite proficient with uh, the, the understanding of the principles and the values. They say, okay, well, this is, this is great. We've got people who are, you know, really, really understanding the principles and the practices and the values and putting them to use and experimenting the methodology, but, but that's today. How do we know that's going to last and, and not end up like our, our you know, leaning tower of Pisa here where centuries from now it's you know, off center or, or even worse? Unfortunately, there's actually a, a, a several examples, at least one I can think of, of quite large companies who've invested millions and millions of dollars of getting agile coaches in and doing agile training um, and really being invested in it and you know, actually a few year, leader, years later, five, six years later, they've ended up kind of regressing in, in entirely. So how do we actually prevent that from happening? And how do we do that very deliberately? So consider for yourself in your own organization right now, um, if you were tomorrow to, to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to fulfill a lifelong dream. I'm going to go travel the world and um, do that. And you do that for 10 years and you finally return 10 years from now and you, you step back into the same office and you discover all the people you worked with are no longer there, they've moved on. In fact, the people who succeeded them are no longer there. there. In fact, maybe the people who succeeded them are no longer there. You know, you're, you're two or three generations in. So you walk around and look around the office, what, what do you think you might expect to find? What will, be people, what will people be doing? What will be their behaviors? What will be their methodologies? What, what values will be exhibited by uh, the, the decisions they make on a daily basis? And how can you today plant the seeds to influence what that'll be like 10 years or more from now? <clears throat> and, and we talked about uh, um, uh, Jim Shore this morning, and, and I think uh, himself and Ward Cunningham uh, and a few others kind of have, it's, this is a really, there's been a few uh, blog posts lately about, you know, the potential devaluation of the word agile, or we're not exactly sure what agile means, or we, we use it and we're not necessarily clear. Um, and I think it does have value, but I'm going to give you my own mental model. So when I'm talking about agile, this is my own mental model, and it's not necessarily saying it's right. No model is right, but some are useful. Um, but this is what I'm thinking in my own head. And I think there's some benefits to it that help me. So, when I think of Agile, I think of it along these three dimensions. The first is technical excellence. You know, we want to be really, and it goes back to Diane's talk this morning, you know, one of, the, one of the dimensions is we want to be really good at what we do. We want to be really good coders. We want to design software to accommodate change. 
We want a good development ecosystem. We want to be practicing TDD. Let's get really good at what we do. Another aspect, another dimension is you know, lean. You know, that's the lean product management, the economics behind um, our, our organization. So incremental value delivery, short feedback cycles, whole system optimization, validated learning, all the, the lean, Eric Ries' uh, lean startup, uh, a lot of what he uh, brought, to, uh, brought to light. And finally, there's this, this human dimension, a transformational leadership. And so this is what Agile tries to talk about in terms of the servant leader, right? And if you look at the transformational leadership model, and, and there's you know, books and, and uh, materials on it, but we you actually read what the transformational leadership model says, it's exactly what we're trying to achieve in servant leadership. We want to inspire others, give them a sense of purpose, challenge them, build them up as a team, lead by example. This is what we want to achieve with our, with our Agile teams. So I think by breaking it down to these three dimensions, there's some benefits to it. One, it allows us to have better conversations. Because now I can start saying, well, how do we improve the technical excellence of our organization? You know, how, do we, how do we embed lean principles in our decision making across the organization? How do we improve transformational leadership in our organization? And you could look at each of these independently. You could just focus on one. But I think the real value comes in, they're mutually supporting. As, as you improve one, as you, as you get really good at transformational leadership, you will see impacts in your technical excellence. Your technical excellence will um, enable um, your ability to uh, operate lean. And it's this whole of organization approach. You know, it's, this is no longer about software, right? You could apply this to any type of organization in this model. And you can now start having conversations about how these, how these interact. How does one impact the other? And so you could even take Agile out of the vocabulary entirely. If you never use the word Agile, but you were constantly working and improving on all these three dimensions, I think you'd ultimately um, achieve what Agile was setting out to achieve. So I wanted to bring that up. That's my own mental model of Agile. So whenever you hear me talk, that's, this is what I'm thinking of. Okay, um, I'll, I hope I'll address that, and then if I don't, ask that again at the end, please, okay? All right, thank you. Um, so I've got um, 13 years in the Army, in the Canadian Army as an uh, officer. Um, I've also been a programmer, I've also been a product manager. So I like to think about, okay, a lot of the challenges we have are, are in the, uh, the human dimension, you know, individuals and interactions. So they're not necessarily unique to the software domain. So how can we look elsewhere? What other domains can we look at? And the one I'm familiar with is my time in the Army. So what can I learn from the Army? Well, the, the Army and the military has a few unique um, characteristics which are, are very similar in, in this respect. One is, um, uh, one is they've got a rich culture and history. In, in Canada anyways, our, our Army's heart culture is, is largely influenced by uh, British colonialism, just like, uh, just like yours in India. Um, and that's been passed on from generations to gen generations. We also have a very specific and unique domain knowledge, the profession of arms, right? That's a, a very unique uh, set of, and specific set of knowledge. And thirdly, we've got a very strong value system. You know, the, the warrior ethos, you know, is, it embeds everything we, we be and do. And we also have a unique challenge in the sense that our attrition rate is very, very high. So how do we persist all these things when you're losing people all the time? And by losing people, I mean it's physically demanding, it's demanding on your family. You know, there's a very high turnover rate. And so how, how do we manage to do it? How did we manage to do it in the Army? How do we make sure that we were responsible for our own, um, our own self-determination over time? And how do, we, how do we sustain? And so I'll ask the question, where do generals come from? Where, you know, the, the top rank, where does a general come from? You know, if, if I have an empty general position, how do I fill that? Well, I, I can't, you know, does the stork come and bring a general on my doorstep? No, unfortunately not. Um, can I put an ad in the newspaper and start interviewing for generals? Well, that doesn't exactly how it works. So where does a general come from? And, and the answer ultimately is, is they're made. There's a very deliberate system in place to take someone from day one of their career all the way up to the highest rank possible. So all the, the training and the experience and the development opportunities, 
and the opportunities for, for risk and learning um, are more or less all laid out. Now, everybody's going to be a little different, and of course, not everybody's going to make it. But the point is that uh, systemically, as an organization, there's been an enormous amount of thought into making sure that we can continue to produce people up the highest rank who are, share the same values, who can make decisions that e exhibit these values, that have the right technical skills. And um, an interesting example, um, so I'm, I was a signals officer, which is basically uh, the IT of, of the Army, right? We, we manage the communication systems, network servers, uh, uh, radio systems, so IT of the Army. And if I took um, a recruit off the street at the, age of, uh, at the age of 18, and he was going to be, he or she was going to be a technician, I put them through basic training, I, um, you know, and then they do their technical training, so they learn how to administer a server, and then they do their job for about four years. They might be working at a, at a help desk or an admin desk, doing their job, learning their craft. And then at about year four or five, for almost anybody, um, we send them on their first leadership course. We send them away full time on a leadership course very early in their career. Guess how long that leadership course is? Take a guess. Oh, a whole year. Well, that's, that's really impressive. And, in Canada, anyways, the first one is, is, is two months long, so less impressive than a year. But um, still, can, how many how many organizations here at you know year four or five of someone's career send someone on like a two month long course on leadership? In fact, you probably have a hard time finding CEO, CEOs in their entire career who have that much had that much focused training on on leadership. But what they do do on that course, uh, be, there's some classroom and there's some field work where it's a very challenging situation. But one of the things they'll do is they'll teach them how to teach. So very early in your career, you're given the skill set of how to develop and teach others. And that foundation means that you now have an intellectual and a theoretical foundation that you can continue to develop and you know, learn and experiment and make mistakes as you go on throughout your career. So when they come back, they'll end up you know, maybe managing a, you know, a team of three or five on the same IT desk that they were, um, that they were at before. But uh, now they've, you know, they've had this opportunity to uh, learn how to uh, teach their knowledge and, and pass it on to others. So what would I take away from this is leadership is, is consciously developed early in the, in the career and then continuously developed throughout the career. And training others is this critical skill that, that must be taught and practiced. And it's something I think we often forget about. We don't teach people how to teach. And that personnel development is a top priority. If I, if I waver for one year and, and, and lose focus on making sure that the next generation is being developed, I put the entire organization at a huge amount of risk. It means at some point in time in the future, we won't be able to fill that general position because we lapsed in making sure that people were constantly progressing and constantly learning and constantly being developed. And then when that happens, we means we have to sacrifice. You know, we have to go for someone who doesn't have the skills. And this can have trickle-down impacts in the whole organization. And if you want a good example of this, it's actually how uh, the U.S. Army, after World War II, their general development program for, for generals actually massively failed in developing generals properly, and the impact of that was Vietnam. And there's, there's a, a book by Tom Ricks on that. So everybody's familiar with the term hack, right? In software terms, a solution that solves an immediate problem while potentially sacrificing long-term long consequences. So we're familiar with this in the technical realm. Now, do we do this in our organizations? Do we implement short-term solutions? We've got an immediate problem, we need to solve it, and potentially there might be long-term consequences to that that are, are less desirable. And I'll make a bold statement, and this will be very controversial, and I'm okay with that, but um, is Scrum a collection of organizational hacks? And I'll suggest that maybe it is. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because there was immediate problems that needed to be solved. If you look at um, uh, Schwaber, uh, Schwaber and Sutherland when they were developing Scrum, they had dysfunctional aspects of the organization. And they found specific solutions in pretty much little, every element of Scrum. You can look at Scrum and you can see how it was solving specific problems. Product management was broken. 
You, know, you had teams that didn't know how, to, technical teams that didn't know how to collaborate. You had managers who were bad leaders. So what do you do about it? You, know, you can look at Scrum and you can easily see how they were trying to answer those questions. And it's not bad because they solve those challenges. And in fact, many organizations have the same challenges. That's why Scrum's so, uh, so popular. And in fact, the short-term solution is, is the right thing to do in, in almost all cases. But now that we've done it, you know, now that we implemented the short-term solution, we've, we've bought ourselves some time, let's go back and look and think, hmm, maybe what were some long-term consequences that now we have some time to go back and address and see if there might be a, a better solution. And here's one example. Scrum masters should not be managers. Are you familiar with this? Yeah. Why is this? Everybody, everybody seems to be taught this. Why do we not want them to be managers? Sorry? Okay, why can a manager not be a servant leader? In fact, don't we want our managers to be servant leaders? Because they're going to be promoted to be directors, and then they're going to be promoted to CEOs. And don't we want our CEOs to be servant leaders as well? Because that's good leadership. And, and here's the questions we need to start asking ourselves. So is, you know, is this an example of an organizational hack? And I, I think it might be. You know, what if managers are leaders, are scrum masters? What if it's the same thing? If we, have good, if we develop good leaders that become managers, what's, what's the problem? And I'm not saying this has to be the case. In fact, I'm sure there's many cases where it's not. But let's start you know, looking at why did, we think that, why did we think that they couldn't be scrum masters in the first place? And a lot of the reason is we had managers who were bad leaders. So one solution is to marginalize them, and then we'll recreate our own version of leaders right? in the, in the form of the scrum master, and we'll teach them servant leadership. But is that the best long-term approach? You know, now consider, where do all these other roles come from? Vice presidents, managers, CEOs, leaders, product owners, directors. You know, we want them to exhibit certain behaviors, have certain organizational values, but where do they come from? And the answer, again, is they're made. And we are making them today, whether we're deliberate about it or not. Because right? you will end up with people in these roles. But if you're not being deliberate about it, you'll end up with, you know, through negligence, people <laughs> necessarily not being the... the what we want to exhibit and, and, uh, in, in terms of organizational values, in terms of our um, agile values, right? So if your leaders can't teach it, how well do they really know it? Right? If, if forever and ever and ever and ever, every year we have to have outside consultants come in, and, and, and consultants do a great job, but if perpetually we don't have people in leadership positions, whether it's managers or, or directors or so on, who understand these values well enough and these behaviors and, and practices well enough to pass them on. How well do we really understand what we're doing? And I think we want to get to the point where leaders at all levels, all the way up to the CEOs, really do understand this stuff. And we have to start building those people today. And it's going to take time, and I understand that. But this isn't just a technical skill, right? We, we talked about how this is, again, we talked this morning about how this is organizational. You know, it's across the system. It's not just agile values as something the team does. No, those are organizational values. What behaviors do we want as an organization? How do we make decisions as an organization? And so consider that same question again. Ten years from now, you return to your organization and discover a practice that resembles neither Scrum ban nor Kanban, or, or anything else you're familiar with today, how do you react? You know, let's say your team today is doing, is doing Scrum, and they're doing perfect, perfectly, and you come back 10 years from now, you discover a, a different set of people, and they, you don't have a clue what they're doing. Is that scary? You don't recognize it at all. Would you assume that that's a failure? The organization has lapsed. Exactly. Maybe they've progressed. And I think that this, this would be scary to some people, and perhaps even you know, some people who are really, really invested in, a, um, in moving towards Agile. But really, what, what ultimately do we want at the end of the day? What's our acceptance criteria? And if it is teams and, and organizations that can progress, we have to be accept or even be um, trying to get to the state where we want that to happen. And it might be something, it might be generating the body of knowledge which we don't even understand today or know today. So ask yourselves, what, what will self-sustain in your own organization or where do you want to be? What do you want to self-sustain? Um, I think at the very basic level, the methodology. 
right? I mean, this is kind of the, uh, you know, you can, you can pass on the very basic methodology. So you can do Scrum, and then in the next generation, they can do Scrum, and the next generation, they'll do Scrum. But what's the problem with that? Why would you not want to do that? Like, is this, it's okay, but what's, what's, the, what's, what's the problem? Sorry? Wait, yeah, right, there might be some. Thing, things, things progress, right, right? I mean, this is, this is where we get into dogmatism, right? You know, we're, we're doing something, but we don't really understand necessarily why we were doing things, right? And, and James Shore had the, the, um, the cargo cult um, agile blog, where they basically he talked about this, this phenomenon. So, okay, what can we do about that? What, can we want, what do we want to sustain? What do we want to pass down from generation to generation? Methodology is a start, but more importantly, I think we, we need to pass along the principles, right? You know, the actual reasons why we're doing what we're doing. And I, I think that's better, for sure, but it's not perfect because we can understand what we're doing, we can understand why we're doing it, but from usually what I've observed, there's this, you know, there's this culture aspect of an organization of, okay, it's good, but we want to get, you know, we want to get better, continuous improvement. And there's this, this passion for discovery, right? You know, how do we make sure that we know 10 years from now, we're still going to have people in the organization that have that same passion for discovering new and better ways that we have today? And leadership, how do we pass on leadership? How do we develop the next generation of leaders? Not only that, not just leaders who can lead for today, lead the people in the organization of today, but have that ability to, to train others, you know, to develop the next generation, and develop them to develop the next generation. Then we start going on and on and on. And um, this isn't a maturity model, but if I were to look at an organization, I would look at them and, and, and ask them questions about, like, well, how do you do this? How do you do it deliberately and mindfully? What, what things do you have in place that you know this is, this is what you're trying to achieve? You, you're, you, you know, are, you're just sustaining the methodology or do you have systems in place so that you know confidently that you're, passing, you're going to be passing things, uh, passing things on? Explain to me how you do that. And it should be very deliberate and people should know about it. So my success criteria is, as an uh, Agile coach is I want to successfully walk away from an organization knowing that they will continue to discover new and better ways of developing software. I want to be able to come back in 10 years and see something different, right? I want them to have pushed the body of knowledge and experimented and tried new things. And, and if I don't recognize it, you know, that's okay. And I will have been so confident that when I left the organization that there was this uh, embedded systemic ability to pass things on that if they as they were making decisions and experimenting and trying new things, they were doing so with full understanding and knowledge of the principles and where we came from. So they were making the right decisions along the way. Okay, so that's all good. That's all nice and good theory. What are some things that, um, what are some things that you know, I've seen working with, uh, working with teams? What are some things that we're trying? And these are actual things that I'm working with teams on back home that they are developing at this moment. And um, I'm sure there's more to it, but here's some things. So uh, we've, we've started to focus at the, the leader level, like the, so the scrum master, the team lead level on um, focusing on behaviors. Let's look really deliberately at what people are doing. And we just talked about that with the gam gamification as well. Let's, let's be really, really deliberate about what behaviors we want and what values are going into you know, making those behaviors. And it might be very tactical as a coder. How do I decide? whether to spend a little bit more time refactoring this or making it a, a slightly better technical solution or not. You know, how do I decide whether to go talk to someone about this design? How do I um, know when to, when to collaborate? You know, how do I know how to interact with other teams and other team members and communicate my ideas effectively? And with the idea that if we're, we develop people and we're focused on developing people who exhibit the right behaviors all the time, we're, if we're constantly doing the right things, then delivery will be, in that, will be this, this consequence of it, right? If we're doing the right things, you know, um, it's not to say we don't want to be transparent or track this. We definitely want to have an eye on delivery, but it's going to be, you know, a sec it's going to be more of a second order effect. And 
if we're not able to? Well, it's because there was legitimate technical risk involved in our project, which there always is and there always, there always should be. So by focusing on behaviors, um, because the, the, the converse is not necessarily true, right? You start focusing on development, or focusing on delivery, you can potentially start creating um, the wrong behaviors, right? If you're not, if you're not being very pay, or very paying a lot of attention to them. And I think this is one of the traditional problems many of us have seen in organizations is the focus, to, uh, the focus on delivery um, incentivizes uh, you know, poor behaviors or ones that don't serve us in the long term. But you really, to focus on behaviors first, you have to have a really, really clear sense of what those behaviors you want, right? What, what things you want, you, you're looking for and how do you develop those people? Um, so develop at leaders at all levels to be agile coaches. If I, I, mean, I think we kind of this kind of came up in um, conversation at, at breakfast this morning with um, with Jeff uh, Patterson. Uh, um, you know, if I could have my way, and it's funny that this came up because I was thinking about it last night. If I could have my way to do an you know an agile transformation in a company, I would I would first go to the CEO and teach him. I would teach him lean. And then I would teach him transformational leadership, and make sure he understood it really, really well from a theoretical basis and how to apply it and, and evaluating his own company along these principles. And then I would teach him how to teach his vice presidents. And then I would watch them teach their directors. And then I'd watch that trickle down. Because at that point in time, you know, this is, you know, the organization at all levels actually buys into the same, you know, this, the same principles because now they can develop the people below them, right? Now it's like, okay, I am, I, I know this. I know this stuff. I'm going to help you um, understand it better, so you can develop. Because this is, again, it's a, it's a whole of organization approach. Now, of course, that's not possible. But think about what you can do, right? Where can you influence these things today? You know, you can't talk to the CEO, but you can start developing, you know, maybe your your uh, your team leaders and, and and thinking this way, and so that when they progress through their career. 10, 15 years now, we will have a whole industry of, of people who get it and understand it. And a good way to do this is, is creating training materials and development plan and, and your own. There's lots of great ones out there, and I'm not saying they're not good. In fact, they are. But again, how well do you really know it if you can't train it yourself, if, if you can't express it and train others? So we've got a team of Scrum Masters back home who are there on, of their own accord, are developing you know, a wiki with training material, they're developing their own TDD workshops, so when new, uh, new employees come on board, um, you know, you take, one of the, the team leaders will take a, a week, you know, a, a week or more, to then take new employees through a whole, uh, a whole workshop, and so they get the opportunity to practice teaching it and expressing it, and of course, new employees will have great challenging questions that then will challenge the teacher's own understanding, right? So then when they get further up in their career, they, they, they build this depth, of, this depth of understanding. So the, just the exercise of doing this is, is hugely valuable. Um, and and we, we value developing others. You know, how is this on our performance objectives? Uh, and rewards and promotions should be, should, should be based on how much, you know, how much do we invest in, in developing, developing the people below us or developing the people around us for that matter. In fact, I would consider if I've been in a position for three years, and by the end of three years, there's not someone or multiple people that I have been actively developing who could, could take over my job and potentially do it better than I can, then I would consider that a failure on my, an individual, fa individual failure on my part. Right? If after three years I can't bring someone up to do my job, then I, I personally believe I failed. I should be putting myself out of a job all the time. And I, mean, I don't mean literally putting yourself out of it. Mean, I, I, I trust that if I'm doing this, you know, if I'm doing this and doing the right thing, well, I've just created extra capacity for the organization now, right? I mean, I can go up and do some R&D project, right? Or, um, you know, move on to bigger and better things. I can't be promoted unless someone can be promoted into my position. And, and be very deliberate about your hiring strategy. Think about what kind of people, what, uh, culturally, what cultural fits do you want in your org organization? You know, we talk about um, change over following a plan. Well, what kind of 
uh, people can, can uh, live and work and adapt in that environment where there's collaboration and, and a sense of uncertainty, you know, dealing with a sense of uncertainty and a, and a bias to action. How do, you, how do you work that into your, uh, your uh, hiring strategy? So these are all things that are practical examples of uh, we're working on with uh, teams back home right now. And oh, I was very quick this morning. Okay. Um, so in conclusion, you know, build a self-sustaining organization requires deliberate thought and investment. And if you get nothing else out of this talk, I hope you walk away with that. That you go back to your organization and geez, think, or sorry, think, gee, what would happen in 10 years from now? If everybody else is gone, where will we be? How can I plant the seeds today? And I guarantee it will impact everything. It will impact your hiring strategy. It will impact your uh, promotion and reward strategy. It will impact how you behave in your technically on a day-to-day -day basis, interact with your teams. It should be cross-cutting. And I encourage you to sustain the values and principles, not the practices. You know, know the practices, of course, know why we do the practices, but ultimately if we want to evolve and we want continuous improvement, we need to make sure that those values are really embedded in the organization and they do actually represent organizational values, right? It's not just the dev team has this like agile values thing, but the rest of the organization really values something different and you can see it in their decisions and their behaviors. No, no, this, it, they have to be aligned uh, across the organization. And, they, and these have to be embedded so they persist. And culture is leadership driven. I, I, I had a mentor one time um, say to me, uh, what did he, how do you word that? Um, Everything you do or say, whether in seriousness or in jest, has the immediate impact of becoming policy. <laughs> Essentially, the eyes are watching. People are always watching what you do and what you say when you're in leadership position, and it will impact and will have an influence on, on the culture. You're, you're creating culture that way. Well, what's acceptable? What's not acceptable? What behavior do they want me to do? What will I be rewarded for? What's expected of me? Those, all, those are all the sum of millions and millions of little interactions and behaviors that happen throughout the day, throughout our day that we have to be very, very aware of because otherwise we'll be creating a culture um, unconsciously and not necessarily the one we want. And finally, uh, lead by example. Uh, model the desired behavior. So even if you're not in a leadership position, like in, a, in an authoritative position, like a, you know, you're a people manager, um, but you're just a, a team member, that doesn't, that doesn't preclude you from leadership. You can still lead by example. You can still understand this. You know, you can embody the principles and, and exhibit the behaviors. And you know what? You will become a natural leader and your teammates will follow. Um, I'm trying to think of a, an example of, of this. So um, I've got a colleague, uh, his name's uh, Chris, and we're actually, we're, we're peers in the organization. He's not a, he's not a, um, he's not a uh, agile coach, but he's, uh, he's more of an architect, uh, architecture design type, type role. But I mean, I'm pretty sure he's destined for bigger and better things one day. He's a very bright, smart guy. But, what, but one of his challenges is he's not, you know, he's, he's not comfortable with public speaking. Very, very smart, not comfortable with public speaking, so that's an area of, of his growth. And I can see that maybe there's something I can do. We want, to, we want everybody to grow around us. So what can I do to help him grow because I want him to be successful someday? So I say to him, you know, let's put a paper in for uh, the Agile conference and then I will work with you. And, um, you know, and then this is a great opportunity for, for you. And you know what, the, just the other day we found out the paper was accepted, so he's gonna be going to the Agile conference uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this summer. And then I have an opportunity to, to, help, to help him grow. And by doing all of this, I'm hoping that, um, just as on a peer level, that I'm hoping that I'm demonstrating the behavior that we want others to have. And, may, and you do this often enough and people will notice and they'll, they'll, uh, um, they'll pick up on it. And this can be really, really powerful. Um, I've had the benefit in my career of having at least three leaders who are also my managers, um, who I have the utmost respect for. They, they become mentors to me. Um, I, I listened to everything they did. I had, they, they, I had utmost respect for them and they earned the respect from me. 
um, to the point where I would literally fall them into a hail of bullets. And they worked with me and developed me and, and um, worked on my strengths and, and they knew my weaknesses and they knew my work on a day-to-day -day basis. So they were a coach, a mentor, a guide, and I think about it and at the end of the day, why would I want anyone else writing my evaluation report? Right? I've got such immense respect for these people. They know me, they know my strengths, weaknesses, I know they're working to develop me. You know, I, I would feel cheated if anybody else wrote anything about, well, this is, this is who Sean is, because I mean, they knew me better than, than, uh, than anyone. And I hope that, you know, I, I personally hope that I can help in some little way to generate um, organizations that can create those type of, those type of leaders, because I, I don't believe that I am one myself, but I hope that with the right potential and the right encouragement and in some little way I can help other organizations create, uh, create those type of leaders that I've been so blessed to have um, in, my, uh, in my life. And that, uh, that, wraps, up my, that wraps up my talk, so um, thank you. This was, uh, this was a lot of fun. I was uh, very uh, brief, but hopefully worthwhile, and maybe we have some time for more questions, then we can all go eat, and I love Indian food, so that's lots of fun. Okay, questions? Yes? Sorry? Yep. Yeah. But the typically what the problem we see with the managers, they love uh, command and control. Uh -huh. That will never allow the team uh, to self-organize and self-driven, meaning it's not a sustainable mode. Right. right. One thing. The question to you uh, is, I, I totally agree with that uh, Scrum. Uh, it, it does allow the innovations, uh, I mean, the sustainable and as well as a self-driven team. But in the, in the long term, uh, uh, what, what I see is a problem typically. The team picks up some, some of the tasks in, in terms of user story. They finish it up and then picks up something else. They flip it from the back. So in actual, the innovation never happens. So they took the user story, finish it up, and pick up something else. Whereas if you look up to the waterfall, they have time to do some innovation, spend some time, get something, Okay, I'll answer your first question first. So the question was, um, essentially, why, is this, why, why would you not want the Scrum Master to be a manager? And you've seen the specific example, and this is the one that um, um, uh, Schwaber and Sutherland had, was, okay, you basically have managers who are exhibiting bad leadership, right? They weren't exhibiting transformational leadership. They weren't being servant leaders. They weren't empowering the teams, right? So um, we've <coughs> systemically, as an organization, we've somehow enabled someone to you know, be in a manager position without exhibiting the leadership qualities that we value. So the organizational hack to that, the short-term solution is, okay, let's marginalize the manager because they're a bad leader, and then we create our own manager. So that's exactly why, most, that we, why we do that in that situation. But it, let's not just worry about our current situation. Where do we want to be? And where we want to be is that at leaders at all level exhibit the type of leadership we want. So you might not be able to solve that problem immediately today, but you can start thinking about how do we start developing people today so that when they end up being promoted into a manager job, they have the right leadership qualities and, and they're exhibiting that servant leadership and transformational leadership we want. Does that make sense? Okay, so the second question was, um, how do you make time for innovation and you know, innovation and continuous integration in, in something like Scrum because there's this kind of hyper focus on getting user stories done and how do you build in the time? Um, there's uh, multiple ways that you can accomplish that, I suppose. Um, and it, it, often it depends on the context, and, but ultimately the, the organization has to value it and has to be comfortable with, with investing the time in it. So really the question is how do you allocate and, and make those trade-offs for what amount of time is valuable or how do we weigh opportunity for innovation against uh, amount of work that needs to get done. And um, 
That's the real question that you need to, need to answer. Does your organization value it? How much can we invest in it? And then how you do it, there's, you know, you can say, you know, uh, you can have hackathon days, for example, where you take a week, or you can, you know, say the last day of iteration, or you can evaluate continuous integration user stories on a, on a you know, per case basis. So, multiple ways of doing it, but ultimately the organization is valued. Right, right. So, was there a question there? Or was that, okay, okay. Yes, yeah, that's, yeah, you're right. So, um, you know, there, time, you know, time left over in a sprint, is, is, that, is that your suggestion? Time left over in a sprint could be used to, you know, that's, that's definitely one approach um, I've, I've, uh, I've seen before, yes. Um, any other questions? Yes. Um, I believe you can. I believe you can make a leader. And in fact, there's, some people will have natural characteristics, as you, as you point out. So if you put a group of people together, just a random group of people, you will have natural leaders who emerge from that, emerge from that group. Um, so you always end up with some form of uh, leadership. It might be good forms of leadership. It might be bad forms of leadership. Um, but it, it will emerge. But what we want to do is um, we want to make sure it emerges. We, we foster the right, you know, the right kind. We develop the right kind. So it's great in that setting if you, you know, you have that opportunity and self-organize a team. You know, maybe a team of, of, of peers. You have the one person who demonstrates this natural talent for leadership that other people gravitate to, and they they show the the spark of exhibiting, you know, the right type of leadership characteristics we want. Okay. That's great, you know, but now how do, we, how do we take that and make that deliberate? You know, okay, we see some potential there. So what other skills do they need to have to progress all the way up to, let's say, CEO of the company? And how do we get them on that track, if that's what they want to do, to, to, to get there? And um, how do we give them the support structure and the, the systems in place to make that happen? Or there might be the other person on the team who doesn't have the natural, it doesn't have the same amount of lab, natural leadership capabilities, but has an interest in it and wants to work really hard at it. I believe that they can do that because I think I'm somewhat of an example. I'm not going to pretend I'm a great leader, but if you looked at me back in high school <laughs> as, the, as the nerdy, shy kid, and then, you know, where I've come in the last 10 years and where, you know, just time in the Army has taken me, um, I personally really believe that you, you can teach someone if they've got the... Um, you know, a, a certain amount of potential, and they've got the interest, and they're willing to you know they're willing to work at it. So, I think you can make leaders. Means how many organizations are willing to invest? Sorry. How many organizations are willing to invest in uh, today's uh, situation, where the marketplace is changing so fast, and to meet up that pace? If I try to invest, you know, on the people to make leaders. <coughs> Some, some might take five years, some might take 10 years. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether I will get a return on investment or my company even will exist. Mm -hmm. So how will I sustain this model? Ah, I see. Um, so the question is, is, how do I know if it's worthwhile to invest in, let's say, leadership development because I don't know if my company's going to be around in, uh, I don't know if it's going to be around in 10 years. Um, well, if you're planning on your company not being around in 10 years, well, then don't. <laughs> don't. <laughs> it's, it's not the question. I'm saying is today, there is a startup which yep. has brewed, a, you know, something like, you know, WhatsApp yep. and Facebook requires it. Yep. Okay. Then I have a strategy made for me to make that sense sufficient. But the, by the time it got acquired, 
boom, gone. Right. right? It's not that uh, I'm saying this my company doesn't exist. The, the phase in which the changes happen mm -hmm. and it evolves, I doesn't have much control. Right. right. Okay, so um, I think I just might actually be a good example. My company might be a good example of that. So I was part of an acquisition. Um, and there's been other, there's other acquisitions before us. And um, a lot of the actual senior people who've moved up through the company were part of, these, part of these acquisitions. So even in that case, if you're part of an acquisition, um, you can actually be in a really good position. Because if you've got strong leaders that you've developed, that's often very apparent when they become absorbed into the greater organization. And they're more likely to have the chance to, to move their way up. And in fact, I've seen it personally. And they're more likely to move their way up. And then you've got this great opportunity where now you've got someone of, you know, the, the fast rise in the organization because they're good leaders. Now they're in a position of influence so they can influence the organizational values from that which you had as a startup. So um, you might look at it as, well, we're not going to pay off, get the payoff to this. And you might not, you know, but that's a risk. But I think it's a worthwhile, I think it's a worthwhile risk. I'm not suggesting send everybody off for a year of leadership training, that's, but, but where, where is a good worthwhile investment? Any, any more questions? Okay, one more. Yeah. Yep. Contradictory to the point that is above and below it. Uh, okay. Where do you see the leaders uh, exhibiting the organizational values and everybody in the team and organization doing that? Would you say the culture would be inspired by leaders um, but exhibited by everybody rather than being driven by leaders? Yeah, yeah perhaps worded it better yeah. than I did. Um, Ultimately, I believe that leaders should understand their responsibility for, for guiding culture deliberately. What culture do we want to have in an organization? What does that really, really mean? And how does that translate to uh, interactions and behaviors? And what high-level policy decisions have second and third order effects that influence the culture at the, you know, down in the teams? And they need to be very um, aware of that because if they they don't and they have no influence, well, a culture is going to develop, right? There will always be a culture that develops, but it won't necessarily be deliberately and it won't necessarily be in line. So there always will be a culture somehow, but um, leadership does have, a leaders do have responsibility of being very mindful and deliberate about, well, what do we want as a culture and how do we create that? And, if, and, the cult, and if one of the things our culture might value is, is leadership and leadership development or Developing people who are really strong technically in TDD. I mean, there's, it's, it's very broad, a broad scope. So, thank you for your time. Uh, this was a lot of uh, a lot of fun. If you've got any more questions, feel free to come up and ask me uh, afterwards. And I've been uh, um, lucky enough to uh, uh, be a part of the um, Ask Me Anything panel that's happening uh, later today. So, um, that question of command and control is I, I love that one. So I hope someone asks me that question. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. So please feel free to come talk to me afterwards and I'd love to meet all of you.